Good morning, Elmsdale Church family. Here we are again on this virtual service. And uh, I'm sure we're all wanting to change and looking forward to being able to gather again and worship together. And we're not sure yet uh, how long we will we'll continue to do the virtual service. We'll keep you updated on that. Uh, things are changing uh, starting Monday in which we give God the praise, but it means as a church family, we need to be praying. Uh, pray especially for the families and the children as they go back to school on Monday and the young people as they go back to high school later in the week, I believe it is. And so we need to be in prayer. Uh, I just uh, want you to be aware that we will be doing up a February calendar and of course all of it is in flux. Uh, but we will do our best to be able to communicate to you through the weekly newsletter or through a messenger group or the Facebook page in different ways to let you know what we are able to do and what we cannot yet do. Uh, you can always drop off your ties if you like or mail it or e-transfer and the church office is always open on Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 9 to 5. We've also put at the door um, some of our weekly newsletters so if you're not on technology and you have a problem getting that you can pick up a hard copy of that. And so now we just give God all the praise and the glory as we worship him together. God bless you today. Bring light to the darkness you 
opportunity to uh, gather again today in prayer, Lord, as we, as a church, are somewhat separated, but we are united together through your Holy Spirit, and we are still the church, as we've said through this pandemic, whether we're gathered or scattered, it doesn't negate the fact that we are the church of Jesus Christ here at Elmsdale. And now, Lord, you have a calling and a purpose for us as a corporate body, and you have a calling uh, for us as individuals that we all are called to fulfill and to press on towards that goal uh, that you have for us corporately and also individually. Uh, God, I pray now for the strengthening that comes through the presence of your Holy Spirit. The two words that have been staying with me this last week is that those words of power and presence. I just can't seem to get away from them. Uh, that, Lord, I'm praying that now for myself and for us, but I'm also praying for us as a church family that we would know your power today and we would know your presence, O oh God so that we can continue to press on. We know and thank you for the good report and good news of things being lifted a bit again. And we don't know what that means for us yet as a church. It's, it's still not back to where we think it should be. But God, we're trusting you that that's just around the corner. But we are mindful today as people will be uh, going back, Lord, to school this week. And we pray for our educators and we pray for the children, Lord, and, and our young people and those who are studying at university and colleges. And we're just mindful, Lord, uh, of this is exciting news, but it also comes with uh, much trepidation and, and much uh, requirements too, Lord. And so we pray for a good week and that uh, you will bless them, O oh God, and keep them safe. We are mindful right now of those who are isolating. Uh, and I'm not just talking about isolating because of uh, being uh, positive with COVID. I'm talking about what this has caused for us. This isolation of being alone, of not being able to gather with our family or our full extended family, our friends. Not be able to sit across the table and enjoy a meal together. All the struggles, Lord, that this has brought for us. God, would you just be present at our table and be present in our homes? 
I love that picture of the two that walked to the road to Emmaus and you walked right alongside them in their grief. And then, Lord, you sat and had dinner with them and supped with them. And when you broke the bread, their eyes were open to see that you had been with them all along. Lord, would you do that for us this week, that we would have a sense that Christ himself is with us and Christ himself is at our table. And Lord, I pray for those again who are grieving. We think of these nine families on the island who have lost loved ones uh, due to COVID. We're praying for them. And we think again of those in our family that just in recent weeks and months have lost loved ones. God, with the God of all comfort, again, that presence and power be so real to them. And now, Lord, we pray for those who are recovering from surgeries and those who are in a hospital that need a special touch and those today that are even at home that need a healing. God, thank you today that you are the great physician, and I pray for your healing touch upon their lives, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, we all pray together, and we all can say amen. Amen. And amen. And amen. Good morning, church. Um, today we're going to be reading from Philippians 3 verses 12 to 14. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I remember as a parent on long trips and even a grandparent with two grandsons on a trip from Toronto to Newfoundland, that statement that we all dread that we hear constantly on a long trip, that statement, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Have we arrived yet? And actually today, that's kind of the theme that's in our passage that Paul said to the church in Philippi in chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Have we arrived at our destination yet? Paul gives us some guidelines in this journey called faith. He says to us that pressing on is the goal. It is the only way for us. What is the goal actually that Paul talks about in our passage, it is that conformity to Jesus Christ. It is to be like Jesus. He says the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. But the goal is also Christ is our king and it's his coming kingdom. It is this resurrection that we're all looking forward to. He actually mentions it in the uh, paragraph just above our passage that Christians are drawn towards this goal, this glorious day, like an athlete sprints towards the finish line. Why is this goal important for us? See, salvation, my friends, Paul would say, is just the starting point. It is the starting line of this race of faith. It's important for us to realize that God has a goal for each one of us. It's not just to get us in the door. He is not looking merely to save us. He is also wanting to work in us and transform us. And so Jesus, my friends, sets the standards for all of us, our Lord, our victor, our king. He already ran the race and he's already won the race and has won the victory for us. And we stand in his victory. He is our example. He is our model to follow. And the Christian is one who is ever moving forward to Christ's likeness, but also moving forward to that great day of our King. And it takes growth and it takes time. And some of us, it takes longer than others. But praise God, God isn't finished with any of us yet. This prize that's out there is worthy of any effort any of us would give. It means living in this present world and situation and even a pandemic in light of that future that is ahead of us. 
It is all about King Jesus and his coming kingdom. And so we are told by Paul, we should live in the light of that glorious future that we are all moving towards. I love what Colossians 3 verses 1 to 4 says. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life of appears then you also will appear with him in glory if you think you have already arrived you've missed the finish line you've missed the targets Paul says not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect the word here perfect is gold teleos it also means complete or mature I like what somebody says. It is not, we don't like the word perfect, but it's functional perfection. When things function perfectly in the way that they were created to do. And so it's like uh, uh, being fully grown uh, versus undeveloped. It's, it's like someone who is very qualified in their work versus someone who's just a mere amateur that's trying to learn. And so Paul is saying that in no way has Paul, the Apostle Paul, hasn't arrived yet. He's not yet complete or a complete Christian, so he continues to press on. See, there's a delusion out there of perfection. Real people, I like what somebody said, real people are not perfect, and perfect people are not real. Just because you are maturing in your faith, just because you've walked with the Lord many years, it doesn't mean that you have arrived. Paul hasn't arrived, nor has anyone else, as long as you still have breath. This is the reality of true maturity is we come to a place where we realize we haven't arrived yet and we continue to press on in all that God has for us. You see, the race isn't won or lost until you get to the finish line. And so there's no time for slacking off. Praise God also, we're all running each uh, our own race. We're, we're not competing with each other. We, we, we don't uh, say, well, I can, I can kind of uh, lax a little bit here because I'm better than so-and-so. No, we don't compare ourselves with others. There's no competition here. The aim is that we make it to the finish line and we finish well. He says, but I press on, Paul says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. See, Paul is uh, eager, zealous to press on because Christ has taken hold of him. He, he's trying to grasp uh, for what that which Christ has for him because he's been, another way of saying, been grasped by Christ. See, Jesus encountered Paul on the road of Damascus, and, and he grasped him, and, and God had a new purpose and a new vision for Paul, and Paul feels compelled by that. He's bound to that. He's pressing on to God's purposes and plans for him. And Paul humbly knows it's all because of God's grace, God's wonderful grace. It's not what he's been able to do, but it is what Christ has been able to do in and through him. I remember many years ago listening to Joyce Myers and one of her messages, and it always stayed with me, this funny statement that she said. Uh, somebody had told her, well, I've walked with the Lord for 40 years. And she responded to him, liar. He was shocked by that. She says, you've walked with the Lord for the last 10. For 30 years, he dragged you. For many of us, our Christian journey has been like that. It is because of the grace of God that we are where we are today. Paul is aware of that. Are you reminded and aware of that today? I had this vision this week as I was preparing this message of a fireman being lowered down from a roof on a rope 
uh, because they're trying to get to a person who is in a burning building to save them. And as they come up to that window, that person is there and the fireman will grasp them and put his arms or her arms around the person. And what do they say to that person? Now, you put your arms around me and grab me and I will get you out of this situation. I will get you to a safe place. I will save you from this fire. And I think this is kind of the picture that Paul has, that God has grasped him through Jesus Christ, and now he's holding on tight to Christ. But we also must be conscious today that as we press on of our own limitations, we can't just think that this race is easy, or we run it all on our own strength, because we'll never make it to the finish line. Paul says he tried to do this faith thing on his own, and he failed terribly. He had put his confidence in his own flesh, but for him it had become rubbish. Back in verse 7, he says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Do you realize rubbish, the word he uses there, is actually the word for a manure pile? That's what Paul says, that anything he tried to do on his own strength was like rubbish. He says, be careful, don't forget what's behind, don't look at the past. If you continue to look at the past, it's going to slow you down and might even trip you up. And see, the pitfalls of the past that, if we're not careful, is we can be weighed down by our past memories, by our past sins, by our past failures. I'm sure if Paul allowed the enemy to haunt him, he could have been haunted constantly about all the things that he had done in, his, in the past when he persecuted the church. There was that famous movie, The Chariots of Fire, that is about this runner, Eric Little, who tripped and fell in his race. See, he had a choice in that moment. He had a choice to either throw in the towel, to be so disappointed and just say it's not worth it, or to brush the dust off him to get up and get back in the race. My friends today, we all have that choice in the face of setbacks. It's interesting that Eric Little, we're told, actually got, made the choice to get back in the race and to continue to press on. And as he was running, God gave him the strength to overtake others in the race, and he actually won the race. And it's a wonderful story because he was a great man of faith. When we all fall, When we all mess up, praise God, we have an advocate we can go to and ask for forgiveness. But we also have a choice to either dwell on that or to get up and to press on with Christ's help. And so Paul is saying, forget what's behind. Failures, falls, bruises, mishaps. And it's time to press on, to strain towards. That is how you're going to finish this race. I like what somebody said, you cannot start the next chapter of your life if you keep rereading the last one. Did you get that? You cannot start the next chapter in your life if you keep rereading the last one. And so you have to forget the past. Sometimes, too, we have to be careful. We need to forget the past because we can become complacent as we think about all our spiritual successes, all the things we've done in the past for the Lord, all the things we've done in the past for the church. See, Paul was determined that he would not rest on past accomplishments, but always look forward to what he needed still to do. That needs to be our emphasis, even in the pandemic. Not what we've done in the past. What do we still need to do? There are Christians, and I've heard it in all the years of ministry, over 30 years. Oh, I remember the good old days. I remember the past. And it almost seems like their faith is stuck in the past. And and I would ask them, what is God doing today? And what is God wanting for you to do and do in your life in the future? I love this metaphor. Somebody said it's like our vehicles. If you notice, our vehicles have a rear view mirror, which is very small, and we have a windshield, which is huge. That should say something to us. Oh, it's important to look in that rear view mirror. It's important to see what's behind. But the emphasis is you're going forward. The car wasn't made to go everywhere in reverse. The car was made to go forward, and therefore you have this 
large windshield. And so we press on. Bruce said, a competitor in a race does not look over his shoulder to see how much ground he has taken and what he's done back there or how the rivals are getting on around him. The runner has to keep his eyes fixed on that finish line. And so you have to forget what you've done. What is it that God is still wanting you to do? What does God have for you yet to do? You know, it's interesting. We live in a day where everybody's counting their steps. Many aim to have 10,000 steps a day. Apparently, the average is 4,000. And, 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 and if you, in a year, uh, do the average, you, in a year's time, will take a million and a half, close to a half, one and a half million steps. Now, if I was only looking at all the steps that I have taken, I would miss out on the steps that I'm supposed to still take. That's what Paul is saying here. Instead of looking at what you have done, he is asking you to think about how many steps you have left. A marathon runner doesn't finish the race by thinking about all the kilometers that he has accomplished. His focus is on the finish line, and he continues to think about the kilometers he has yet left to complete. And he grits his teeth and he pushes through and presses on. My friends, today our call as Christians is to press on. Oh, we're conscious of our limitations, but we are confident in our Lord who helps us and empowers us. And so pressing towards this goal is the only way to run this race called faith. Listen to what Paul says, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal. He says, there's this one thing I do, I forget what's behind and I press on. One thing, it's not looking at multiple things, it's not being duplistic, it is that simplistic, one simple focus and goal. This one thing I do. And so he's stretching forward and he's reaching for it. The actual word that Paul uses here is that of a Olympian runner who is coming to the tape, to the finish line, and he puts everything within him to cross that line and touch that tape. He presses on. I loved, I was reading uh, from the diary, this quote from the diary of John Wesley about pressing on and keeping on. And just as interesting in his diary from May 5th, and he said, on May 5th, I preached in St. Anne's and was asked not to come back. The evening of May 5th, I preached at St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. On Sunday, May 12th, he preached in St. Jude's. Can't go back there either, he put in his diary. On Sunday, May 19th, I preached in St. Somebody Else's. <laughs> Deacons called special meeting and said I couldn't return. On the evening of May 19th, he preached on the street. He was kicked off the street. Then his entry on May 26th, he said, preached in a meadow, chased out of a meadow as a bull was turned loose during the service. Then on Sunday, June 2nd, preached out at the edge of town, kicked off the highway. You would think he would want to give up and give in. And then Sunday p.m., June 2nd, the evening of that same Sunday, in the afternoon, I preached in a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear me. John Wesley. See, sit back and relax. Paul says, no way. Neither would John Wesley. Too many Christians emphasize God's grace at the expense of, that it doesn't matter now what I do, how I live my life. It's all about God's grace. I can just sit back and relax. Or maybe there's some who are saying, now I can sit back and relax because I've run hard in previous years. I ran really hard before the pandemic. Now let someone else do it all. After all, it's my turn to relax. I've done my part. I deserve this. Oh, what a lie of the enemy. Paul says, until the end of your Christian life, until you still have breath, 
You are to be like that athlete, that runner, training and straining towards the goal that is set in front of you, is set in front of all of us. See, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence, in season and out of season being the same. Talent will not, someone said, nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not, unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not, the world is full of educated derelicts. Press on. Persistence and determination alone are what are important. See, one day there was a famous athlete, Cherry Paddock, and he came to his school to speak to the students. And at the time, Paddock was considered the fastest human being alive. He told the children, listen, what do you want to be? You name it and then believe it, and God will help you to be it. There was a little boy who decided that he too wanted to be the fastest human being on earth. And the boy went to his track coach and told him of his dream. His coach, who was very wise, told him, it's great to have a dream, but to attain your dream, you must build a ladder to it. Here is the ladder to your dreams. The first rung is determination. The second rung is dedication. The third rung is discipline. And the fourth rung is attitude. The result of all that motivation is that he went on to win four gold medals in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. He won the 100-meter dash and broke the Olympic and world records for the 200-meter his broad jump re record lasted for 24 years, and his name was Jesse Owens. Because that wise coach said to him, you must build a ladder. The first rung is determination. The second rung is dedication. The third rung is discipline. And the fourth rung is attitude. My friends, I believe the Apostle Paul would say amen to that. What matters is not how many steps you have taken, or how you have taken them, what matters today is how you will take the steps you have left. Whether you have a billion steps left or just 50, Paul urges you to press on towards the goal, conscious of your limitations and his wonderful grace, but yes, confident in your Lord who won the race for us all. We know that Paul did finish well. Towards the end of his life, he was able to say to young Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. What would we think of a winning Olympian runner who was so careless about partying and celebrating that he missed his own medal ceremony. We would think it was foolish. What a fool, we would say. Why would he throw away his memory of a lifetime for a few drinks? We would think it's crazy. But I want to challenge you as we bring this to a close. That is what the enemy is wanting from us, the Church of Jesus Christ. Get your eyes off the prize. Get them on temporary things that feed your flesh and miss out on the glorious prize that God has for you. The enemy will tell us to indulge, to slow down, to sit back, to settle. Settle for immediate gratification instead of the wonderful better prize of eternal joys that is waiting for us. And although Jesus already ran the race and won the race, we still press on because the prize is yet to be placed around our necks on that podium. Keep your eyes, my friends, today, Paul would say, on the goal. Press on towards the goal to win the prize. Press through the past. Press on through the present and press on into the future. And with God's grace, we will all finish well and get there. God bless you today. All I want, help here, build my life upon all this world. No.
Receive today's benediction. Go now and press on in the path to which God has called you. Do not get caught up in the things of the past or in the things that the world prizes, but welcome the new things God is doing and take the new paths that open through the places of death. And may God pour life-giving waters into your wilderness. May Christ Jesus make you his own. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you for the race that lies before you. We go in the peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen and amen. May you have an awesome week in the Lord. Press on. Mm -hmm.